So the key to understanding veterinary neurology is being able to do a good neurological examination and interpret the results. So I'm going to share with you my top tips for doing a neurological exam over a series of videos. In these first two videos, it's laying the groundwork, how to take a good history and to use a neurological exam sheet. So the first part of making a good neurological assessment is taking a good history asking the right questions. So things uh, that are really quite obvious to most vets is what is the actual problem? If it was an episode, what did it look like and how long did it last? When did the problem start? And what is the progression, the timeline? That's very, very important in neurology. Was it acute onset versus something insidious that the owner can't quite pinpoint when it started? Has the course been static? Or has it been progressive? If it's progressive, has the animal improved? Usually that's a much better prognosis than if the animal has been getting worse. And here I show two examples of animals presenting with cerebellar problems. And the face of it look relatively similar. And I'll talk you through them. This is an animal with a cerebellar tumour. We can see the normal brain. This is a mid-sagittal brain here. Um, this is the top of the head, this is the nose area, um, and uh, this is the forebrain. We've got some hydrocephalus going on here because of obstruction of the CSF pathways in the hindbrain. And this is a gadolinium enhanced image, and so we have this large tumour, which is probably a meningioma, uh, compressing the cerebellum. By contrast, we have a cerebellar infarct, a stroke. Um, which looks to be in the similar area. Um, we also have a, a mid-sagittal image. This time it's weighted in T2 um, so that we can see fluid very clearly. So we've got again hydrocephalus here and an area of white, but this is an area of white because of static fluid because there's been an infarct. But although these animals look on MRI quite similar, they presented in very different ways. The animal with an infarct would go very per acutely from being uh, neurologically normal to abnormal. And then given time, often these animals will progressively improve. Whereas the animal with uh, a cerebellar tumour had a very insidious onset and in fact was much less disabled than the animal with the cerebellar infarct because it had had a chance to compensate for the, uh, the, the growth in the area of the cerebellum. And so actually this animal was still walking, whereas this animal was completely uh, unable to walk and obtunded with epithetonus. So the severity of the neurological signs isn't as important as the progression, the timeline, because um, one very severe diseases may have been um, quite slowly progressive and therefore the animal is able to compensate, whereas acute onset diseases, the animal is unable to compensate, is more severely affected. So you need to know what, when and how. Those are the most important questions. The next thing we need to do is to actually um, review the neurosystems. And for this, I use the acronym of GASP. So that is gait, activity level, sleeping and pain. These aren't specific to neurology, but um, these things can be altered quite a lot by some neurological diseases. And if you don't ask the question, you don't get the response. And this is what I, uh, uh, I often find is that people don't often ask about whether the animal's sleeping patterns have changed. Um, owners may volunteer that information, but, uh, but people um, veterinary professionals are less likely to ask it. So, according to the owner, this is before you've actually even examined the animal, is the gait normal? Um, and it's important to ask quite specific questions for the species. For example, cats, um, are, the first thing that usually goes is their ability to jump up or jump down. When they jump down, their ability to land uh, properly. So is the animal's jumping ability affected? Is their ability to do more complex manoeuvres affected? 
Is their activity the same or changed? You know, is the animal an indoor and outdoor animal anyway? Are they going for the same duration of walks? Is the jumping ability altered? Are they playing like they used to, hunting like they, they used to? Perhaps they're becoming more likely to stay indoors. Maybe they're older. Maybe you think it's just down to that, but, but uh, uh, it may not be just that changed. Has the animal um, doing the same sleeping? Are they s sleeping in the same position, um, the same posture, the same place, and for the same length of time? Is the sleeping being disrupted, for example, by play? This is an, an, a, a cat that ha was presented actually to my uh, uh, general practitioner colleagues when I was working in a practice which had both a GP practice and a referral practice. And uh, my colleague brought this cat in to see me because he was concerned about the sudden change in behaviour. And the cat was actually presented because of scalding, because it was sleeping and hiding by hot white water pipes. It was a complete change in behaviour for this cat. Um, um, uh, and he turned out to have a brain tumour. And also, does the animal uh, owner think the animal is in pain? And if they do think it is in pain, why do they think it is in pain? You know, um, uh, it's not unusual for people to interpret some signs the animal has as pain. For example, quite often co uh, commented that licking lips is due to pain. No, it's not. Licking lips is due to anxiety in most cases. Of course, they may be anxious because they're in pain, but licking lips is not an, an, an indication of pain. Um, uh, uh, by contrast, an animal that is panting uh, and shaking may be in pain. Pain is not always indicated by uh, vocalisation. In fact, if you think about if you are in pain, if you had, say, a headache, then you wouldn't vocalise to express that you had a headache. You'd do some other kind of behavioural response, such as withdraw to a quiet room. Animals are the same. So the next uh, is to ask more specific questions about their behaviour changes and also their voice, their kind of so social uh, interaction. The monomic, I remember this by, is frames per second, um, uh, which is a, bit, uh, is a bit lame, really, but it stands for family, pets and strangers and also sound. So is their interaction with the family the same? Is their interaction with other pets the same? Is their interaction with strangers the same? And do they sound the same? Just because some diseases, especially neuromuscular diseases, they can have a change in voice, a so-called dysphonia. If you don't ask the questions, you're often not told that. So uh, our next question is to look at the other systems review. Um, what's their appetite, their thirst and urination, gastrointestinal signs? What do they get fed? Um, are they receiving prophylactic um, uh, health, for example, vaccination or wormer? Um, have they visited some other countries? That's quite important in the UK where we um, uh, are fortunate enough uh, prior to climate change not to have some diseases. Um, however, these diseases can be brought into the country on ticks, etc. And really anything else. And there may be um, dedicated questionnaires that you can use. For example, um, we have the uh, questionnaire for Chiari malformation, pain and syringomyelia. Um, and that is found um, at this website here. It's called Chiari Check. And that will ask a series of questions um, to either the vet or the owner and generate a score of likelihood of whether or not they have Chiari pain or a syringomyelia. And there is other uh, questionnaires that can be used, for example, um, for older animals. Uh, I know this is a cat, but we have cat ones as well, the canine dementia scale, KD's cognitive function score and other ones uh, are available. Uh, my next tip is always use a neurological exam sheet. There are many available. I'm going to show you, uh, that's the first page of my own. And I will still use these um, when I have a complicated case. And if you're not used to doing a neurological exam, then I strongly recommend it, especially if you use one like this, which actually tells you if you have a deficit, um, where the localization is. So if you have uh, a deficit in vision, then the problem is either going to be the optic nerve um, the eye or the um, cerebrum, the forebrain, uh, and, and so on. So if you're not used to doing these tests, then this provides a way of going through them 
and then you can kind of join the dots by working out uh, which um, uh, which areas are affected, and that gives you the localization. And so this is the uh, the full one, um, which uh, I'm, uh, say you can you can download them from books. Um, uh, you can email me, and I'll probably give you a copy of mine. Um, and uh, this is the way that they're scored here: reduced, normal, increased, and clonus in the in the case of um, uh, some of the reflexes. Now, sometimes people ask me, you know, neurology is so complicated. It's got so many complicated words. How do I localize something, for example, to the olive nucleus of the brainstem? The answer is you don't need to. I really only want you to localize it to three main regions, uh, the brain, the spinal cord, or the neuromuscular system. And this is if you're for prognostic purposes and also if you're investigating um, uh, anything, for example, by radiographs, there's not much point in giving radiographs of the entire spinal column if the animal has a neuromuscular disease. You're just wasting um, uh, your time, the animal's um, welfare and uh, the owner's money. In the brain, we like to ro localize it to the, either the forebrain, the cerebellum or the brainstem, but quite frankly, localizing it to the brain is, is a start. And in the spinal cords, we localize it to these um, uh, really four regions, uh, C1 to C5, C6 to T2, T3 to L3, and L4 to S, S3. They're often lumped together, although sometimes I will separate those um, out um, because it is quite a, a wide area. And so that is the purpose of the neurological exam. Our next tip is on observation um, and look out for the next video on that.